This video is sponsored by Sunflex UK. A couple of days ago, I came across an article in Home Building and Renovating magazine. John Inverdale wins planning battle to add loft conversion with snooker table to his £2 million seafront mansion. The UK media love a good story about the planning system, even better when it concerns a celebrity. Now, I had to look up John Inverdale, never heard of him. Turns out he's a sports commentator for the BBC, and some people on Twitter don't like him. I wouldn't worry about it, John. Nobody likes anyone on Twitter. From my point of view as an architect, this planning application didn't seem particularly interesting. So what? Rich guy gets permission to make his big house even bigger. Until I dug a little deeper. You see, I've been altering and extending private homes in the UK for almost two decades, and most of my clients have never hired an architect or set foot on a building site. If that sounds like you, this design and the way the planning application was handled can teach you things you need to know about how the process works. Now, I got the drawings for the application from the local council planning portal. It's easy once you know how these things work. Took me less than a minute to find them. I'm not about to give away this guy's address, but everything I'm going to discuss has been reported in the media or is contained in the planning application, so it's already in the public domain. The design and the application were done by a firm who seemed to do a lot of work with large, luxury private homes in this part of England. So far, so good. I checked the property records online and the house was sold in January this year and the planning application was lodged in February. They got down to work straight away. Nothing wrong with that, but it can cause issues. Now, I have no idea if John Inverdale lived in the locality before he bought this house, but if you are looking to buy a property in a new place and immediately set to work, keep in mind this can upset your new neighbours. Within a fortnight of the application being lodged, three neighbours made objections, and the local parish council also made an objection, but the timing of that one was critical, and I'm going to explain why. You want to avoid objections if you need planning permission. And the reason is something called delegated powers. The Planning Act gives planning officers the sole authority to determine if modest proposals like this one should be granted planning permission unless enough objections are made against the proposal. Each local authority can decide where to set that threshold. Rural areas tend to have low numbers like two or five, and urban areas often set the threshold for objections higher. If enough objections are made within the 21-day consultation period, the planning officer no longer has delegated powers. They just vanish. If that happens, the local planning committee make the final decision. And they are a bunch of elected officials, local councillors, politicians. All bets are off. This has only happened a few times in my career, and it can be a nightmare. Trust me, you want the planning officer to make the decision not the committee. So how do you avoid this? Well, as soon as the local planning department register your application, they go out and notify the neighbours. This can take the form of a letter posted to every address within a given distance of the site boundary, or they might even ask you to pay for an advert in the local papers. In this application, they put a notice up at the site, just tied a piece of laminated paper to a post for all the neighbours to see. The point is, all of these methods are impersonal. They can come as a dreadful shock to neighbours. So I always advise my clients to take a copy of my drawings and go door to door before the application is lodged. It's not foolproof, but I found over the years that meeting people face to face makes them less likely to lodge objections. It's so much easier to destroy someone's hopes and dreams if you've never met them in person. The same goes for local community or parish councils. They can be particularly active, especially in small, well-established communities like this one. The Planning Act can give parish councils statutory consultee status, putting them on the same legal footing as the Roads Department or the Environment Agency. Remember delegated powers from earlier, where the planning officer can make all the decisions? Well, if a statutory consultee lodges an objection, the officer loses those delegated powers. I found the minutes from the meeting of the parish council where they discussed this application. Man, had they a lot to say about it. 
The proposed triangular second floor gable window will be detrimental to the privacy and amenity of the neighbor's house, as it will overlook the neighbor's house and its gardens to the front and side of the plot. The proposed triangular second floor gable window, due to its size and dominant position, is out of character to the rest of the property, due to its size and dominant position at height, will cause a spread of light that will adversely affect wildlife and the enjoyment of the dark night skies by other residents in the neighbourhood. The minutes from that meeting also say that no members of the public were present at the meeting. In my opinion, this was potentially a huge mistake by the applicant. If you know the parish council will be discussing your application, you absolutely should attend. Just like meeting the neighbours, showing up is half the battle. But John Inverdale got lucky, and here's why. The parish council waited until six days after their meeting before they sent their objection to the planners. It was made the day the consultation period expired, and the planning officer was careful to note that in his report. Had that objection arrived one day earlier, the planner would have lost his delegated powers, and the application would have gone to a vote by the local councillors. The planning department's own website makes clear if they had received an objection from the parish council within the consultation period, the application would be decided by the planning committee. But it didn't. Instead, the officer had to review the objections and use his training to reach a decision based on the guidance published by the planning department. The parish council and the neighbours had four main objections. The new roof lights would look onto private ground. The new triangular glazing would not be in keeping. All that additional glazing would cause light pollution, and the proposed games room could instead be used as a bedroom. Shocker. I've seen plenty of objections over the years, and to be fair, some of these are reasonable. But none of them is a deal breaker. Let's see why. Loss of privacy is a reason enough to refuse a planning application. If you propose to build a window which might overlook your neighbour's rear garden or their bedrooms, this is a problem if those were not already overlooked. The planning officer contacted Mr Inverdale's designers and asked them to explain how overlooking would be dealt with. They provided this cross-section drawing which shows the proposed roof light and an average height person only just about able to see out horizontally never mind peering down into the neighbour's garden. It is common for planners to contact us during applications for things like this to be discussed. Even changes can be made to the design at this stage if it helps resolve issues. The proposed triangular glazing was considered by the planning officer in his final report, saying, The extent of this window is not significantly harmful to the design of the dwelling, and the introduction of another large gable ended dormer to the front roof slope is acceptable. The form of the host roof is non-standard, and the dormer remains sympathetic to the existing roof design. This dormer would consist of materials to match the existing dwelling, and would be of a scale similar to that of the central front gable end at first floor. It would remain in character with the dwelling, and is acceptable. The objectors also complained that all this new glazing would cause light pollution. Now, when I saw that, I knew they were clutching at straws, and the planner agreed. I mean, look around. The place is full of houses. It's hardly a wilderness. There are windows in all these other homes. On that note, the sponsor of today's video are Sunflex UK, and they make high-quality aluminium frame windows and doors. Check out this video I made about their bifold door range. I've used Sunflex products on my own projects, and they offer a great balance between cost and quality. I'll put a link up here and in the description below. The last objection was made by a neighbour who seems to think they had uncovered a conspiracy. The games room could also be used as a bedroom. It's even got an ensuite. Thing is, you don't need to point this out to the planners. They've seen this before. And if anyone watching thinks they can pull a fast one by labelling a room for one activity, but actually intend to use it for another, like a bedroom, it won't work. The planners' main concern with bedrooms is that the more people in a house, the more cars they will need. If those cars have to be parked on the public road, that can be reason to refuse an application. They even have guidance and formulas to calculate how many cars a property will need. The officer noted in his report that the property would retain sufficient parking provision owed to a large front private driveway with sufficient parking for a minimum of three cars in accordance with the parking standards. And with that, he granted the application. But this is not the end of it, not by a long shot. Next up, Mr Inverdale would need to get building regulations approval. This is separate and different to the planning process, and in my experience, most homeowners have no idea how it works. 
I made a video explaining the difference between planning and building regulations. If you need to know, there's a link in the description. Check it out. There are a lot of things to consider, but one that jumps out is that the new games room, or bedroom, is more than 4.5 metres above ground level, putting it in the next category of fire risk. According to Doc B of the English Building Regulations, that means it needs a protected enclosure leading from the new room to the outside. So every door in that corridor and off the stairs, including any existing doors, must be self-closing fire doors. I count 10 doors. Sprinklers are an alternative, but there are restrictions. For example, the kitchen has to be separate from any open plan area forming part of the escape route. As far as I can see, the new room in the attic is feasible, but something else jumped out when I was looking at the drawings. This existing chimney is being removed to make way for the games room, but a new one is being built about two feet to the right. When you look closer, this is described as a brick effect GRP chimney. GRP, or glass reinforced plastic, is also known as fiberglass. This is a fake plastic chimney. It seems to be concealing the flue for some kind of appliance. You can see this on the drawings. It's in the games room, directly under the plastic chimney, and in the wardrobe below the games room, and that wardrobe seems to sit right on top of what was the original fireplace in the lounge. If I had to guess, this will house a new stove. I'm still not sure a giant plastic chimney is the way to go, though. The structural engineers will have kittens trying to secure this to the roof. I mean, it's in an exposed seafront location. It could blow away. My guess is that the engineers will specify a huge steel rig bolted to the attic floor and walls below with a chunky steel post running up inside that plastic chimney to hold it in place. I suspect all this will need a crane to hoist into location. Then there's the long-term viability of the brick effect. Fiberglass doesn't look great in its natural form, so I'm guessing they will either paint this or wrap it in printed vinyl so it looks like an original Edwardian chimney. I wonder how long that will last in the sea breeze and sunshine. It's all feasible, I have no doubt this can be built, but my guess is that it will be expensive and might get cut from the project if it goes over budget. So, if you are thinking of buying a property anywhere in the UK with the intention of altering it, you can book a consultation with me on the Real Life Architect website. I've put a link in the description. I can help you work out whether the project is feasible and affordable within your budget, identify alternative ideas that might achieve a better result for you, advise on pitfalls to avoid during the planning application process, identify requirements of the building regulations relevant to your project, and help you understand how to find the right local architect for your project. Please get in touch before you buy the property and always read the terms and conditions before you book a consultation. My name is Neil and I have been a self-employed architect in the UK since 2009. I regularly make videos about the reality of altering and extending private homes, as well as issues affecting the construction industry and the architecture profession. If that appeals to you, please subscribe to the channel.